All right, welcome back. Uh, we are back with our second half of our online daytime live cohorts here uh, for our capstone presentations. We have got two fresh panelists with us today. Uh, Jay Wengro and Andre Slonsky are joining us and they will be asking questions to our presenters after they present. Uh, a presenter will go, a panelist will ask them some questions. We'll swap um, after each student. Sound good? All right, uh, I'm gonna give each of you a moment to tell us a little bit about yourselves. Jay, why don't you say hi? Hi, everyone. I'm Jay Wengro, the founder of Actualize. Really excited to see the projects of the second half. I know this is the beginning of a second half, so I'm gonna keep the intro a little shorter than usual, um, but I'm really excited to see the projects. I know that all the grads from the first half and the second half have put in a tremendous amount of work and effort and dedication and the projects that we see here will, it's just one small piece of the testament of all that effort that they've put in. Uh, so it's gonna be really exciting to see all of that. Um, I just wanna also thank everyone else involved. So Amanda Hale, our amazing lead instructor who led this cohort, uh, thank you for doing such a fantastic job. Um, the TAs as well, Eric and Asia, um, and our careers team led by Lisa and just really excited to see everything. Excellent, thank you. Andre, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, uh, hello everyone. It's uh, super cool to be here and see what you've built. Uh, I myself uh, was in a similar bootcamp, uh, dev bootcamp back in the day when it existed. So I know like the in and out of this process uh, and how tedious and crazy it can be. So uh, yeah, a little bit about me. I worked four and a half years uh, at Intercom with Amanda. And then recently I moved to a different role. It's a small startup called Camera IQ where we build um, AR experiences for companies. Uh, it's pretty cool. And in my spare time, I make electronic music and I recently got into digital art uh, and I'm a crypto and NFT enthusiast. So really excited about that space growing and yeah, I'm excited to see what everybody's been working on. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, our first presenter kicking off our second half group is going to be Joe. Joe, you can take it away and then we'll have Jay panel for Joe afterwards. All right, let me... Uh... Grab my share screen here. All right, hopefully everybody can see that, my uh, my app. All right, so welcome on everyone. And uh, again, my, my name is Joe Suffredini. Thanks for uh, listening in on my app here. So this is the My Hockey Recruiting app. And the inspiration of this was from uh, the many years that my son and I had uh, experienced as he was kind of going through the, uh, he was, pretty high into, or, uh, into, into hockey um, in kind of the recruiting experience that we went through. And I thought this app would help kind of navigate uh, another potential family or user that would be uh, looking to, you know, as a kind of going through the same process. So, um, so I thought this app would help kind of navigate some of the information that, you know, we kind of learned as we went. Um, so just to start, just uh, in terms of the app, there's I've got a button here that kind of details the recruiting process. And this would be for division one men's hockey for college. Um, and I don't know how familiar everyone is with the recruiting process, probably not very familiar unless you're really into the hockey scene. Um, and for, for most of the majority of the players, um, it really starts when they get into high school and in the Detroit area, that's where I'm from. Um, there's five really somewhat elite programs that if you're, you know, good enough to get on, um, you kind of start entering into this recruiting process because that's really a lot where a lot of where the colleges pull their players from. Um, and the five would be Detroit Little Caesars, Detroit Compuware, Bell Tire, Honey Baked Ham, and Victory Honda with, they've got, you know, these, these sponsorships that kind of um, help these teams along. But um, anyway, so if you're on one of these teams, you kind of get into this recruiting process as you go. And again, it's during the high school years that things start that start to you know uh, shape up, and uh, the kids get serious about you know if they want to go on to play college hockey and, and get a degree, which is really the the main uh, you know intent, and hopefully get some of the college paid for. So you start in the in tenth grade is really where it begins. You maybe start getting some conversations, 
And then as you progress through high school, you, you, you get further involved. And then there's this element of junior hockey where the majority of the players will won't go to college right away, right after high school. They'll go into the junior ranks and they may commit to a school while they're in high school. And then the school will ask them to the program will ask them to play a couple of years of juniors to mature and before they actually start playing for the college. So it's a bit different than some of the other um, college sports where the, the your player coming in may be a little bit more mature. And, and, um, and in my son's case, he started when he was 20 years old as a freshman. So, um, so that's kind of the process. So what I'll do with the app is just kind of give you an example of how somebody would use this. Um, first thing would be you, you get into the menu here and you can create an account um, where you can add in, you know, pertinent information um, in terms of your, you know, your location and your current team and everything. Um, since I already have an account, I've, I've made one already and auto filled it here with uh, my, my son's first initial. My son's name's Dante. So I kind of used his, him as an example of going through this. Um, so you would submit that to log in. And then uh, here you'd get the, you know, the other pieces of the app that, um, that you can start progressing through and researching your, uh, your school. So the first thing is you want to do is look at your profile. So um, with the with the account creation, it'll uh, you know put in your avatar and give you some you know some of the the logistic or uh, some of the information on you, some of the details. Um, the intent here that I didn't get to add in as a feature was eventually you'd be able to, and I'll show that a little later. You know, get in contact with a coach where all this information will get uh, automatically populated, just not in this version of the app. Um, here you can edit the profile, and then here is the more important part is kind of the shopping cart um, for, for the player as he goes through and starts analyzing some of the, the, the data on the different schools that he may, he may be interested in. And uh, I'll show that how that works. Right now, he doesn't have anything in his shopping cart, uh, essentially. So the first thing he would do is just go look at all the programs. And this is all of the Division I men's hockey schools that are currently in existence. And in today, in today's world, there's 61 schools that have a Division One hockey program. You can see they they vary um, in in you know so size of the school. Some of them are smaller schools. Some of them are pretty large, like you know Michigan State and Minnesota. Um, so the, you know this is kind of the list that you go through if you want to play Division One hockey. Um, it's a lot smaller the list than some of the other sports. Like I know in football and basketball, there's over 300, but in Division One hockey, there's only 61 to look at. So you know, for an example, a player would kind of look at this and he, he may already have an interest in a school I mean, you say he's in 10th grade. And it's like, you know, I really want to go play for the Michigan State Spartans. That's, you know, big, big hockey program in our area and uh, pretty well known. So from there, he can click on the school and get the information um, about the school. There's there's a link here for the athletic website. Um, kind of just gives you a bit more detail on the school. It gives you more information. Maybe look at their uh, their their schedule and other information can also look at things like, you know, enrollment. Um, so maybe, you know, you may, may, you may not be interested in a large school. Michigan State has actually obviously got a lot of students. So it's a really big, big school and a big hockey program. Um, and then uh, importantly, he's got the coach's contact information. So the next thing you'd want to do is just look at the breakdown of the current roster to see where possibly you would fit in. So in my son's case, he was a, a, a undersized defenseman. So there, you know, there, there, there may not be a ton of opportunities if, if the school's with, you know, is really recruiting big defensemen and they have a lot, but this will help him kind of guide and get maybe some, some cues on to where, you know, that, that this school might be an opportunity. So you can see here their current roster for this past season. Um, you know, they've, they've, they've got kind of a, a mix between upperclassmen and underclassmen. And the thing here is that eventually they're going to be, you know, these, these seniors and grad students will be gone. So there'll be some opportunities coming forward. And then you can see the breakdown between forwards, defensemen and goalies. Um, so you can, again, get an idea of where you would fit in. And then if you want to get more detail on the roster, you can click on the team roster and it'll give you um, the players' names and, and, their, and their position in, in class rank. So you can see that, you know, Michigan State has, you know, four of their nine um, defensemen are, are, are underclassmen and they're really not graduating any, um, any defensemen. They're all forwards. So, you know, if you look, if you're looking to come to the school in about two, three years, there might be some opportunity there. The other thing you can look at as well is 
there's incoming recruits. And like I mentioned in that timeline, you know, kids commit uh, to schools maybe when they're in high school, but they may not enter maybe two, three years after. So this will give you an idea of the landscape on the recruits coming in. And for next season, for 2021 school year, you can see they've got quite a few players coming in. And as it gets further out, they haven't really done a lot of the recruiting. You know, they're still doing the recruiting for future years. Um, so in this case, they've got some defensemen coming in in two or three years. So that might not be a good fit. You might say, well, let me go look at a different school. So um, we'll go back and we won't select this one for our profile. So we'll go back and look at a different school. And one other school that my, my son was 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 interested in actually was being recruited by was Penn State. Um, and again, you get the same information, you know, the school size, the athletic website, and then you again have a breakdown. And, you know, looking at this, there might be some opportunity here if we, uh, you know, look at the team roster. Um, they've got, you know, uh, three defensemen graduating. So there's going to be some opening and they're, they don't really have a lot coming in from a, a defenseman standpoint. And then their recruits, um, they don't seem to have a lot of defensemen, you know, that are, that are coming in. So this might be a good school that I want to put on my list. Um, so I'll, I'll click on this school. Um, it'll take me back to my profile and it'll show my, you know, that Penn state's now in my shopping cart. So I've got that as pinned as something that, you know, I'm interested in and can start pursuing, maybe contacting the coach when the, you know, when the eligibility uh, requirements are, are met or um, the uh, process is met. Um, so kind of use it that way. And then yet another way I could get more information is if I want to take a look at the recruits throughout the country uh, and of all the schools, um, I, you click on this one. It also give you every recruit coming in for, for the majority of the schools. I, now, I don't have the, the, the database completely populated uh, with every school, but here you can peruse names and schools and see where maybe there's some players that you've uh, played against and you'd like to see where they're going. Um, and you know, maybe there's some, some other details you'd like to find out about different players. So you can click on these links here. It'll give you a, a little bit of information on the position and, and their height and weight and kind of see when they're coming in and what the recruit year is. Um, and then one last thing to look at is again, maybe you're not really interested in a large school. So there's, there's some opportunity here where we can do some filtering on the enrollment of the school. So you know, if I look at this right now and I just open up this window, um, it'll show pretty much every school that I had shown previously on the list. Um, but say I want to go, you know, I want a really small school. I'm not interested in 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 these big, huge campuses. Uh, you know, I come from a small town and I'm not, I want a small school so I can limit that enrollment down to, say, just 5000 students. And then, you know, I can I can filter down to these schools. Um, and to be honest with you, I was kind of surprised at the amount of schools that came up on this list, uh, you know, with, with this enrollment. But you can see there's, um, you know, there's quite a, quite a list to pick still that, uh, uh, you know, you, you would, might want to be interested, you would be interested in if you're looking for a small school. So this would be a way to, 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 to navigate through the information. And, um, and like, um, like I said, it, it's a good way to kind of get, a, get some ideas of, of where all the the players are going and, and, and kind of go, kind of go through that process and build your shopping cart. And then eventually, like I mentioned, um, you know, just for an example here, ideally in the next phase of this thing, I'd like to have it where you can click on the coach's name. It'll auto populate with an email form and you can give your stats, your current schedule. So you can get in contact with the coach. Um, so that's essentially my hockey recruiting app. Awesome show. Um, it's incredible to me how much thought you put in and all the detail that goes into this. Um, so well done with that. I'm curious. I mean, it seems to me that there's a lot of different uh, pieces of data and associations. And I'm curious to know, is there indeed a lot of complexity behind the data and this database schema? Yeah. Um, actually, it wasn't as bad as I originally had thought when I first kind of wrote up the schema and kind of did the wiring uh, or with the database with the join tables. I had, I had one join table between school, school IDs and um, in Rust and um, in user IDs. Mm -hmm. And then that proliferated into the rosters and the recruit information. So it was essentially, uh, it was five different, five tables that I worked with. So it wasn't that bad. Um, 
the, the interesting part was just trying to get the APIs hooked up um, that I used to get, to get the information that was, um, you know, and I was a little nervous at first when I said, I don't know, I'm not going to know how to do this. And I kind of worked my way through it. Well, so, that was my next question, actually. Like, where is all this data coming from? Yeah, I used an, an API from uh, Sports Radar, and okay. um, and it was it was pretty good. The, unfortunately, the, the the site I wanted to use was it's called Elite Hockey, and they have a huge amount of data. I mean, they did they've got it from not just college hockey, but every minor professional professional league. But they wanted uh, six hundred dollars for a yearly prescription, and mm. um, <laughs> I didn't. I wasn't going to go that route, um, no. so I hooked up with sports radar. It worked out well. Um, there was two, two different APIs that I had to work with. One was to get to colleges. And then I had to pull the team ID from that into the rosters so that, um, you know, so I said, use that as a kind of a parameter into the other API to get the specific rosters for the school. So I was kind of proud of myself for figuring that out. It was a kind of on a Sunday evening where I got it to work and Mm-hmm. My wife was like, "What? Why are you so happy?" I said, well, look, "I'm really excited." <laughs> yeah, so, that's awesome. Was that was working with the APIs the most challenging aspect of this project, or was it some other aspect? Yeah, I was working with the APIs and, and making sure I got the data or trying to pull out the data that I needed because um, mm-hmm. you know it was it was uh, arrays of hashes within hashes, so mm, it was a little tricky it. trying to get that data out, but. Um, yeah, well, you pulled through. Uh, this is a fantastic thanks. app, Joe. Uh, I love it, and congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, next up, we've got Zach, and Andre will be paneling <clears throat> for Zach today. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Zach. Um, so, yeah, uh, I basically made an app to where uh, people that go on long backpacking trips or through hikers, they call them, uh, who basically hike from the bottom of the country to the top of the country. Uh, There's a trail called the Appalachian Trail and the Pacific Crest Trail where um, it's basically like 1,800 miles um, and the Pacific Crest is 2,000 miles, a little bit over. And um, so I basically built an app where people can get all of their gear um, that they own and they're going to plan on taking on this trip and uh, they can just get an overview and see uh, a display of what they have and how much uh, everything weighs and each category uh, that their gear is, how much, eat, how much it weighs. Um, so uh, here's the homepage. Um, so I'll go ahead and log into uh, the account that I have been working on. Um, okay. So uh, you get into the homepage and you basically click on your pack and uh, you'll get an overview of each category. So you got your big three, which is more, uh, normally the heaviest uh, part of the, the weight that you're carrying, um, which consists of like your uh, backpack and uh, your shelter basically. Um, then you got your clothing, your cookware, and your electronics, and uh, miscellaneous stuff, repair and med kit, and your shoes. Um, people who go on these hikes are really uh, like passionate about getting things to weigh as least as like uh, as least as less as possible. Um, so they go they go through big uh, hurdles in order to get their weight to be you know as light as possible. Um, so uh, basically, you just you have all your gear here and you can add gear um, and choose a category of your gear. It's pretty straightforward. Um, I use some JavaScript to calculate the total weight um, and uh, the weight of each category. Um, so you, you, you can basically just uh, add your gear and edit what you have going on and uh, pretty straightforward. I wanted to use an API, um, but I didn't really find any APIs that uh, had the ideal requirements. Um, So you do have to populate your uh, database uh, individually. Um, So let's say, uh, you know, this is this is a pretty full pack so far, but um, say you just wanted to add a, you know, like a water bottle. 
So you'll add a smart water bottle. Uh, you know, they, you know, you don't want to really take a, a water bottle that you'd pay, like, you basically want the lightest thing again. So you just get the plastic smart water bottle and a lightweight bottle, um, 32 ounces, liquid measurements, of course. Um, and that way, that probably weighs about, I don't even know how much that weighs, honestly, maybe one ounce. Uh, just one water bottle and, uh, you know, that would go with your cookware and filtration and you'd add it. Um, I didn't get it to populate immediately. So I do have to refresh the page and it would show up and, uh, this would be reactive and it would just, uh, you get a display of your weight. Unfortunately, this graph is hard coded in, um, because, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to get it reactive, but I was having a dilemma where uh, the table would render before the data would uh, uh, calculate. So that's something that I do need to work on. But um, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Um, something I do want to work on is like a social channel where people can uh, basically reach out to other people's pack, like see other people's packs and reach out and ask questions about how it's going. Um, but currently it's uh, just under construction here. Um, but uh, yeah, that's basically it. Um, yeah, pretty straightforward. There are a few things I do want to work on afterwards, but this is what I have so far. This is great, Zach. I really like the aesthetics of the site. Like, I like the icons and like how like clean and minimalistic the UI is. So great job on that. Um, what do you think uh, was the most challenging for you uh, in building this web app? Um, there were a few things that I had trouble with. Um, one thing that seems seems pretty simple uh, was getting the categories to, to uh, basically show how to like organize each category. I basically um, had category IDs. I used the join table for uh, the categories. Uh, so the gear ID and the category ID would populate onto a table. And um, I ended up just using a view or like uh, creating a new um, view uh, file. And um, just like, instead of having my uh, code to be super uh, pop like populated with a bunch of different uh, things, I just minimalized it in the view so that it was easier to just uh, filter through. Um, but other than that, this, uh, the graph to make it reactive is something that I'm, I'm struggling with. Uh, but I think there's a simple way to go about uh, doing it that I haven't figured out yet. You will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, what is, oh, sorry, of course, the alarm <laughs> started going off. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> it happens to all of us. Um, what does the edit button do on the categories done? On the um, here? Yeah. Uh, you actually, you, I haven't, you basically just like edit, you know, if you want to bring an extra thing or Got it. maybe you, you cut the end of your toothbrush off and it just weighs a little bit less. Uh, yeah, so just if you have to update anything. So with the knowledge that you have now, if you could like go back and start like a new project from scratch or even like the same project, um, what do you think you would do different? Or like, would you think about the project differently? Like how you approach it? Um, yeah, I kind of, in my back end made things a little bit more complex than they needed to be. Uh, if I could go back, I would make all the uh, logic um, easier through my front end. Uh, I think it, it could have been a lot simpler. Um, but other than that, uh, there's a lot of things that I've learned along the way uh, that my instructors and the TAs helped me with. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm sure I can make it a lot simpler overall, but oh, also, and I could use components. My code is extremely uh, opposite of dry. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I could use components to make things a lot easier. Nice. Well done, man. It's, it's, this yep. is great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zach. Uh, next up, we've got Daniel, and Jay will be paneling for Daniel today. OK. 
Okay, hello. I hope you guys can see my screen. Hello, my name is Daniel. This is my app called Fitify. <clears throat> it is a custom workout builder. Uh, I made this because there are tons of workout apps out there that have pre-made workouts and exercises. And I wanted something that was you know, custom and tailor-made for me. So how this works is you have your workouts, which are essentially playlists that hold your custom made exercises. And it's called Fitify because the original intention was to implement the Spotify API so that you never have to leave the app to sign in and play your music while you're following along with your workout. Currently, it opens the Spotify login page in a new tab. So let's get started. So I'm going to go ahead and log in. Uh, of, and of course, you can always uh, sign up and make a new account and start fresh. We're going to log in. And you see, I have a couple workouts here. I have cardio and I have leg day. You cannot forget leg day. Um, you can always create a new workout and a new exercise down here. Uh, let's check out our leg day workout. Uh, here we have a few exercises down here. Now each exercise is comprised of time, how long it's going to take, how many reps you're going to do, and how many sets you're going to do. How sets are how many times you're going to repeat this whole exercise. Now, of course, you can uh, edit your exercise. You can delete it from the playlist. You can edit the uh, playlist name, delete the whole uh, workout add an exercise from your already made uh, uh, exercises and create a new exercise as well. So that, let's actually look at all of the exercises we have right now. So these are all of our exercises. Uh, as you see, we have burpees and jumping jacks, which were not present in the leg day workout. Uh, let's go ahead and make a new exercise. So uh, let's do lunges for our leg day workout. I'd say it's gonna take 45 seconds. Let's do 20 reps uh, and three sets. And right now I just, I have a, uh, I have it using a URL. The uh, original idea was to implement a file upload feature. That's probably gonna be in version two. Uh, as you see, we have our new, um, exercise populated. Let's go ahead and add it to our workout. Okay, leg day. So we're going to go down here and we're going to add our lunges exercise. And here it is. Okay, so let's say you have your workout clothes on, you have your sweatband on, you're ready to work out. We click the play button. And it takes you to our workout play page. Now, uh, again, you can open Spotify and a new tab uh, to log in and play your music. Uh, this was probably the hardest part of the project was implementing this workout player. Uh, there were tons and tons of different iterations of how this would look like and how this would work. Uh, eventually, I had to come up with this uh, custom made player that syncs the progress bar to your tabs to these buttons down here. So, okay, you're ready to work out. So you do your calf raises. And then when you're done, you go ahead, you click next, you do your squats, you do your leg raises, lunges. And then when you're done, you click next and congratulations, you are now fit. And that is all. That's pretty much it. Amazing app, Daniel. Um, that was definitely, I love the, this actual uh, page where you do your workout. I think it's really well thought out. Um, tell me what you were talking yeah. about the challenges involved with building this page. I guess, could you elaborate as to, you know, what were some of the obstacles and how you overcame them? Yeah, so um, the, I guess the original plan was to uh, have court sign kind of like a carousel 
style and mm-hmm. then finding those libraries and having them not implement correctly and it became a balance of do I spend more time trying to implement these libraries or do I just scrap it and just make it by myself and eventually I had to make that executive decision and it's like I'm just going to build this from scratch so this is built from scratch this with the tabs and the progress bar yes yes cool that's that's cool that's awesome thank you um if you had more time what else did you add to this app oh um tons spotify api um would be nice to have this page be completely dynamic so it goes according to the time that you set and how many sets you're doing so you don't have to press a button it'll have it'll just automatically move to a rest page between each uh exercise so you can get have time to rest and then move on and then finish got it it's very cool yeah thank you um yeah no i very into fitness so i definitely appreciate all that you put into this uh really fantastic app nice job daniel Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Daniel. Next up, we've got Mark, and Andre will be paneling for Mark today. All right. So, hello, everyone. I'm Mark, and today I'll be showing you what I built as part of my time in Actualize. It's an app called Travel Bug, and essentially, it's a collaborative trip planning page. So if you've ever been in a situation where you're planning a trip with others and you got a bunch of, bunch of ideas coming from all over the place, um, but no one can remember what you've decided on and what you want to do, hopefully this can be a way to help with that. So um, pretty much you come in, consolidate your ideas collaboratively and just keep things organized. And it was really inspired by just like planning sessions and group texts over the years and um, I guess I built the project because it was just a fun idea that I thought of and something that I would use personally. So that being said, I guess let's have a look and I'll show you how it works. Um, so essentially what you can do is you can sign up. And so if I wanted to just create a user and just say, all right, I am going to join the app. Um, it's pretty simple. It's just a basic sign up page. And then you're signed up. Your password is password. And now you want to log in. So when you log in, it uh, takes you to a pretty much a trips index page. And so this new user doesn't have any trips yet. So what I want to want to do here is um, I want to add a new trip that this person wants to see uh, film locations for the show that they're really into. Um, and so now this trip exists and it's now in the database and it's not collaborative yet because it's just one user, but what you could do is you could select some of the users that are in the database and add one of them to your trip. So um, my friend over here wants to add Mark as the collaborator and um beyond that each trip kind of owns what's called the stop and stops link to places so essentially what you could do is search for a place add it to your trip say you wanted to leave tomorrow and you want to come back on the 11th and so now your trip has a stop that it owns um and then you can take a look at it um and then within the trip, you can also do some edits. So go see uh, some famous sites. And um, we'll add a couple others. And then we'll add a couple of, um, yeah, grab a couple of ideas and grab a couple of logistics and save those changes. So. My trip's been updated and I've got a collaborator, which is great. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna log out and I'm gonna log back in as myself. So being the collaborator, 
um, I've got an existing account that I've been working with here and I've got a new trip that just got added recently. So I've been invited on this trip. So what I wanna do now is take a look. Um, okay, great. There's some info here. Um, I think I'm gonna add a stop being located in Chicago. I'm gonna add that and stop by after we'll do this. And so I've got a new stop there. Um, things have been updated. Okay, let's see what has my trip owner done to the trip. Okay, they've added a couple logistics, a couple ideas. And also I wanted to note that as a collaborator, um, I can do pretty much everything that the owner can do, except I can't delete the trip and I can't update the collaborator. So you've kind of got co-pilot like co-pilot kind of permissions, but slightly different. Um, and so I don't know. You wanna do something that I think they would like, and then let's go see. Let's go do that, and then hopefully, you know, I'll save my trip, and then I can see that it's been updated, and I can also see that um, it's saved there, and and the other user can do the same. So it, the nice thing about it is it's, it's kind of collaborative. Um, you can sign in, you can view things, um, edit things, keep track of everything that you've thought of so far and just add some logistics and ideas. Um, and so, yeah, that's pretty much the basics of it. I can, I can go into an existing trip. Um, I can look and see, okay, um, someone's added a stop. I don't think we should go. Let's take that stop out. Things have been updated. Um, say you don't really want to go on your trip with, you know, you're collaborating anymore. You can just delete that trip from your database and it's gone. Um, and then also what's interesting is in the rails database, when you delete a trip, all of the stops associated with it get destroyed. So it kind of prevents extra memory from being, uh, left kind of just sitting out in space. So. That's pretty much the basics of the app. Um, you can add, edit, um, collaborate, and add stops to it. And like I said, the stops kind of belong to places. So the stops are really what links um, trips to places. Um, and then of course, users own trips. Um, they can be an owner or a collaborator. Um, in terms of what comes next for maybe a future iteration of this app, I would love to implement a search bar um, when you're searching through destinations, because of course there's thousands of records. Um, and so that comes from a, a service called Simple Maps and it's just all metro areas um, with a million or more people at this point. Um, and then beyond that, I would also love to um, add uh, image upload functionality so that you could kind of customize the image or related to your trip. Um, and I would also love if you could make these public and you could find other people's trips and save those to your favorites list as kind of uh, like a source of inspiration. So um, beyond that, that was pretty much uh, the basics of the application. And I'm glad to answer any questions or show any code if there's anything that people want to take a look at. Thanks. Nice work, Mark. Uh I loved your presentation, first, first of all, like really solid, smooth, clear, like really good job on the presentation part. Um, also the UI and the UX in terms of uh, like the, like when you add a destination or not a destination, when you add uh, the logistics item that automatically like just pops up there. Uh, really nice work there. Uh, it's funny, like the, your, your idea or like your app is very similar to my final project at the bootcamp. It was also kind of like, uh, we called it um, global host instead of local host. So <laughs> it's essentially like finding people in different countries to like show you around. So this is a uh, hits home for me. <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions. Um, what APIs did you use in this other than Google Maps? Yeah, uh, that was essentially the main one. It's okay. just a Mapbox API to get the maps to show up. 
um, and, and pins around it. And then destination data is populated from uh, simple maps. Um, it started out as just every, it was not, it was essentially every location on, on that's been logged, but I filtered it so that there wouldn't be millions of records. So I filtered it to a million, uh, a million in population or more just for now. Um, that's pretty much it. The rest of it's just Rails, Vue, and Bootstrap and JavaScript for the logic to sort of filter what you can and can't do depending on who you are. Yeah. No, this is great. Uh, I really like this project. Uh, as, uh, as far as like what you mentioned, like next things you want to add, uh, I would also love to see you like add notifications. So if someone like adds you as a collaborator or like adds a stop or something, you would like when you log in, you would see like a notification that kind of shows you what happened. Uh, and also another idea you could uh, look into is maybe like some sort of like a confirmation. So if you're a creator of a trip and then your collaborator decides to remove a stop, you like as a owner of the trip have to like confirm that before it's just gone. Mm -hmm. So that would be like another cool thing to look into. Um, but yeah, otherwise uh, really solid work. Awesome, thanks. And that, those are really good ideas. I think it would be cool to facilitate even more communication. So Absolutely. I appreciate it. Potentially even monetize that. I'll yeah, abolish it. <laughs> maybe one day. I, I would use that. I think it's a good <laughs> idea. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Mark. Uh, next up we have David and Jay will be paneling for David today. You see the screen? All right, perfect. Um, hi, everyone. My name is David Quaggan Smith. Um, this is the app I worked on at Actualize called Cover It. So, pretty much the idea is pretty much just a website to be able to post, find, and listen to covers of songs that you uh, enjoy. The idea came from uh, me and my dad having a conversation. We were both pretty into music and always just find random covers to different songs. And uh, I wanted to make a place to be able to find those uh, simpler in a way. So pretty much right here is just the landing page um, to the site. Uh, right away, it just pretty much uh, gives you to create an account option, just the button. And then uh, down below is just more information of what being a user of the website uh, has to offer to you. So pretty much some of the bigger features is the actual ability to uh, add songs. So just the create um, function. Um, so right now I tried using the Spotify API, but, um, I didn't really want to do that either because there's kind of, um, some requirements to actually be able to post on Spotify. And I would have preferred if like any single person was able to post onto it. So right now, all the data comes from people adding YouTube links of these covers. Um, since YouTube is a place where pretty much anyone can upload to, um, future updates, uh, that would impact uh, users. And then the final ability would be the option to favorite songs. Uh, so you'd actually have like a playlist to go through. So um, I guess I'll just log in quickly um, so I can do that. Uh, so once you're logged in, um, the song list anyone can go to. I tried using uh, the thumbnails for YouTube for the images, but unfortunately that did not work out too well. Um, another difference I would have done rather than using um, a placeholder would probably just be like a Lorem Pixum link to uh, generate different images. But uh, so yeah, uh, from here you can pretty much find different songs. And uh, once you click one, you get pretty much put to the show page of it, um, which just gives the name of the song, like who it's covered by, and then a YouTube link to listen to the said song. Um, I was pretty like happy with how this turned out because one of the problems I had when uh, making this was getting from the create when a user puts something on, they have to put a YouTube link, which is like pretty self-intuitive. But the interesting thing about uh, YouTube getting like a video to play within that uh, website itself was they have a pretty specific um, tag of how to get it to play. So I can go to the code here quickly. 
So um, instead of just having the link to it yourself, um, you have to have like an embedded um, start to the link and then also add in like a control so people can pause the song if they wanted to. And then, um, so you wouldn't want the whole link itself. Um, and every YouTube video has a specific video tag, which is on since in every single uh, video, it's from the 32 to the 38 index points in that string. So if you just cut out that part, um, they, you can pretty much just take any user's um, link and uh, make it actually function to retrieve a player with which has controls onto it, which I was pretty happy with how it turned out. Um, so yeah, that's one feature to it. Um, you can also uh, add the favorites if you want to the user. Um, that's where the count function comes in. Um, with the count right now, there's not too much functionality with it right now. You can pretty much just add a song, look at your favorites, and then sign out. Um, the add song, I actually have one over here that I can quickly do. Uh, pretty much just the song title, which would be Atlantic, oops, Atlantic City. Um, link uh, cover artist and the original artist. Um, and then, oops, sorry. Uh, I actually didn't get to this point. Um, for the original artist, it actually has to go off the artist ID, which is an uh, integer. Um, so I just have that memorized right now. Um, so then it populates back down into the index. So you can actually see it now um, appear here. Um, and then if you go to the account, go to favorite songs. Um, now you can go from here, you can go back to the songs you want to listen to. Um, and that was also a big challenge was getting each user to uh, actually get their favorited songs to appear and uh, work like that. But pretty much that is the basis of what the app has to offer right now. Um, in hindsight, it's really interesting working on these because you can just like see like the next steps that you can do to improve on it. And um, I'm pretty happy with where I got to now though. So yeah, that's pretty much it for me. Thank you very much for listening. Great job, David. <clears throat> really, really impressive. Uh, thanks for showing the code and how you built up the YouTube embed. That was impressive and uh, great engineering there and figuring that out. Um, tell me, you know, there's definitely a lot of aspects of, I see back end and front end working together. Uh, would you, do you find that you were more comfortable working with the back end or front end or working, did working on this project sort of change your relationship with either of those two? Um, yeah, great question. Uh, with the back end, I was pretty confident with um, just the CRUD routes and stuff like that. I was not so familiar with relations, um, which was probably the most difficult part for the back end, but I'm pretty happy with where I got with it at the end. And then with the front end, um, I only had pretty limited experience with theme, which was probably the hardest part for me, just getting it to appear and work with um, the data I was putting into it. Um, but I think it was a really good learning experience. I've definitely like, even with such a short amount of time, we worked on these like dedicated purely for the capstones. I think I've like improved my like um, concept of how to use front end much better. So um, I like to say that like at the start, I was very un like unfamiliar with front end, but well, uh, with how it is now, I'm pretty confident in my abilities to make stuff on that. Got it. Did anything like surprise you in working on this project? The most surprising thing is I think I take so many like websites and apps that I just stumble upon for granted with like how much work actually goes behind every single one of these is just so impressive to me now. And just how it all works is crazy. Right. And sometimes building like even with a seemingly small feature can take a lot of thought. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, what else? And you mentioned a couple of things. But what would be like the very next thing you would add to this app? Um, honestly, I think what I'd want to add to it would actually be the Spotify API and then giving a more like 
another song list, but more for verified. And then, um, and then after that would be more filtering options to actually sort through once there's so much data, because it'd be kind of a uh, repetitive having to go through the whole index list every single time. So those two features would probably be priority for me. Got it. Um, this is a great idea. I love the idea for this app. Um, and I don't know if there's anything like it out there. So really interesting. Um, fantastic job, David. Congrats. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Next up, we have Stacy, and uh, Andre will be paneling for Stacy, most likely. Uh, he does have a time constraint, so don't rush, Stacy. But we might have switched up on you. Is all. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am Stacy Tidegui, and my app is called Barks and Brews. Uh, this was inspired because a few months ago I had gotten my first puppy and realized that I am very limited on places that I can go out to eat and bring him as well. Uh, so what Barks and Brews does is it allows uh, a user or even just a visitor to the app to locate uh, breweries or restaurants in Maryland uh, that are dog friendly. So just to quickly go through this, um, you do have the option to log in and sign up, uh, but if you're just visiting the site, you can still look at all of the locations. Uh, you can also filter the locations currently by um, maybe a feature that they offer, the city or the zip code. So uh, as you can see, this is a nice long list of places to go. So if you just wanted to browse that, but maybe you just wanna go somewhere that has an outdoor patio. So now it's just gonna only show you locations that have an outdoor patio that you can have a drink and bring your pup along with you. So say I go here and I'm like, okay, I'm interested in going to Jailbreak Brewery. The visitor to the app can then get the information on its location, contact if they have a website, and then read any reviews that were left uh, by users. If you opt to go ahead and sign up, and I'll just go ahead and log in here. And I'm gonna go back to that same exact brewery. You can now see the reviews. And if you were the user that actually left the review, you have the option to go ahead and update that review if you'd like or maybe you completely changed your mind. Um, maybe the service got really bad and you don't even want anybody to have your opinion, then you can just go ahead and delete that review altogether. So say you do wanna leave a review, you can say poor service, don't go, you know, and you're gonna give it one star, go ahead and submit that. And then it's gonna go uh, right to the top so the next person can see it. And then maybe the manager called you and they ended up giving you a free meal or something. So then you can say, edit, you know, you can just change and be like responsive, um, go there. And then change it to now that you get three stars. So then you can go ahead and update your review right here. And then if you wanted to go ahead and you looked at this, you weren't a user, and you're like, you know, I do want to sign up. So then you just go ahead, go to the sign up page, just give it some simple information, just want its name. So we'll call this one Capstone. And then go ahead and login. And then again, since they did not leave these actual reviews, they can't update or delete them. Uh, for the future, I would love to add the functionality. Right now, I just have it as uh, just an image of the location. I did intend to add Mapbox or Google Maps so that the user can actually see where it's located and then you know, possibly get directions. So that I definitely would add into a version 2.0. Uh, 
Um, and I would love to also have it as these are just hard coded, but the option to favorite a restaurant um, and then also make this dynamic for how many reviews there actually are. So yeah, this is my website, Barks and Brews. Sorry, I accidentally locked my computer trying to unmute myself. <laughs> uh, this is great. I love the idea. Uh, definitely something that anyone that loves puppies and beers can actually use in real life. So nice work there. Um, I'm really curious about the, the search functionality. So I have a few questions about that. Uh, first, like how did you implement the, the search itself? So I initially wanted to approach the search bar as it being dynamic, not showing anything at all. And then as somebody starts typing, then they'll start to populate. Right. Um, instead, I uh, went the direction of just filtering the data. So in order for me, at first, I could only do that by one single uh, component. And first it was gonna be just the feature. And then realizing that, well, maybe, People just want to go somewhere local near them. I just added also the condition to search by either, you know, if they wanted to go just this city, they can put in their zip code or they can put in like an actual city name itself. And then it'll filter through that. Or then if maybe they just really want to go somewhere that has good food. So um, that was how I ended up making it a little bit more dynamic. Instead of just one single search parameter, I was able to add in three different ones. That's awesome. And then what happens if I search for something that doesn't exist? It just shows then up. It, it just won't populate anything at all. So like if I accidentally mistype, yeah. then everything will get removed. Nice. This is really smooth. I like how it like automatically uh, updates as you type, like it gives you the results right away. This is great. Um, uh, also, one thing that I noticed while you were demoing uh, with the, the reviews. So if you update or leave a new review does it automatically jumps to the top yes it does so i did have a bug on there and i was trying to work around it um, with the router link it was automatically just staying wherever it was on the page right. however right. when i did the essentially like a force refresh i was losing some of the styling so I kind of had a way out, which one is more important? It's staying at the bottom of the page or losing a little bit of styling and then having to refresh. So I, that was probably my hardest thing. And I just, I had to remember MVP, it's working, you know? And so <laughs> yes. I, I wasted way too many hours trying to figure <laughs> that one out. And I was like, you know, I'm going to call it a day on this one. Nice. So I actually like that. To be honest, I don't know, like you, you think it's a bug. I think it's a feature <laughs> when if you like update a review, like you want the most relevant or the, the reviews that were like the uh, like the freshest or that was updated latest to be shown on, on the very top. Exactly. Right? Yes. So that's that's actually nice. Um, this is great. I like the idea. Uh, what do you think uh, is the next feature that you're going to add to this? Or what I definitely would you have would, added if you had more time? Uh, I definitely would have moved to adding the um, navigation, like having the opportunity for the user to see it like on a map where it's located. And then, you know, maybe having a like a modal where they can put in their directions there. That would have been a great feature. I also think maybe um, allowing uh, maybe the adding an admin function for the you know, the owner of the business, maybe somebody leaves a bad review and then they can go ahead and respond to that. I think that would have been a great feature to add as well. Nice. Well done, Stacey. Good job. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for having me, everyone. I have to jump, uh, get back to my actual work, but this was fun. Uh, best of luck to all of you. And yeah, have a great weekend. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Andre. And thank you, Stacy. Uh, that was really wonderful. Um, last up for today, we have got Tyler, uh, and paneling for Tyler will be Jay. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tyler. You guys can see me all right, right? I kind of have a ring light set up. I'm, I'm usually really dark here. Um, so uh, yeah, awesome. My name is Tyler, and uh, you might think my app is called Game Warrior. 
uh, but it's actually not. <laughs> this is from uh, the theme I used, and uh, it was it was sort of a pain in the neck to change, so I didn't bother. But I did put uh, the name of my app up here. Oh, I just uh, this is called Game Base. So um, uh, the point of Game Base is it's uh, sort of a, a list app uh, where you can keep track of games you're playing, games you want to play. Uh, you can leave ratings and reviews on games that you've completed, uh, and the inspiration for this came from. I started a, a game studio, a little indie studio at the start of uh, our cohort when I started, you know, studying computer science and, and coding and all that. Um, and uh, a lot of times when I'm talking to the other devs, uh, you know, I want to tell them about a game I played or like a thing uh, that I remember from like a game. And, and sometimes I just I forget all the games I've played. I've played like a lot of them. Uh, so I thought it would be really helpful to keep track uh, and, you know, to also have reviews because sometimes I think I, I look back on games I played when I was a kid and I have rose colored glasses and maybe it wasn't as good of a game uh, as, uh, as I remember it being. So, uh, yeah. So when you're not locked in, um, you, uh, you have a, uh, the, the standard games index page here. Uh, you can choose from a whopping six games. Um, and in a later version, I will implement uh, an API, a game database, but I, I felt that six games was just a good number for now. Um, these bubbles here uh, represent the average user rating for uh, the users of game base, and they are actually dynamic. So if a, uh, a game has a rating over eight, the bubble will be green. If it's a rating of seven or I believe under eight uh, and up to five, uh, it will be yellow and anything under five gets a red bubble. So, you know, sort of a, a little bit of a, a touchstone to tell you which games you should avoid right off the bat. Um, and if we just click on a random game here, uh, we get a bunch of information. Now, uh, the theme that I picked, uh, it was really difficult for me to find a theme that sort of matched the functionality that I wanted. Um, so I, I have these spaces here because I actually just repurposed a blog page for this. Um, so there were like images here and I, I didn't want to mess with the CSS, uh, but I was able to get all of the information to display. So we have things like the average user rating, um, what platforms is their multiplayer, the ESRB rating, as well as the reasons for the rating, uh, who developed and who published it. We get a nice little cover art here uh, an about section and some reviews uh, where you can see the users and uh, what they rated and what they wrote. Justin, has some very strong feelings about this game, um, as it seems. And if we click on the name, uh, which in the future I would like to put um, user profile images, it brings you to the list page. So again, I had to repurpose some sections. So this is a bit threadbare. Um, in another version, I would like to have things collapse. But in general, um, this organizes your games based on their status. So you have playing, completed, uh, plan to play, on hold, and dropped. Um, and if we log in here, um, I'll just log in as myself. Um, then it automatically takes us to my list. And you can see that uh, this button, the my list button just popped up, which will always take me back to my list as the user. And here, my list is a little bit more populated. So I have this game I'm playing here and here are games I've completed. And in the completed section, it will show the review that I left. This is my personal review here or my personal um, rating uh you know plan to play on hold stuff like that and now if we go to a game page you can see that this little section that wasn't here before is now here um so this is this is the magic that lets you add a game to your list so you have this little drop down menu where you can select the status so we'll say I completed this game. I could click this update list button here. It says list successfully updated. And then I get this other little button uh, to rate and review. So, all right, I had a great time with this game. Uh, it's a pretty swood game. Submit that review. And now I, I didn't get uh, the reactivity working here, but if we reload here, you can see that now my uh, review has shown up for the game. Um, and if we, wow, that is a crazy rating there. Um, and if we, uh, if we log in as someone who maybe doesn't have a lot of things on their list. So my dog show you, uh, hasn't played a ton of games yet. Uh, he doesn't have thumbs, so it makes it really hard to get through, uh, games. Um, we can see he's only got a couple games on his list. So if we go now back to home and we choose a game he doesn't have on his list, um, 
you can see it, it defaults to plan to play and this button here says add to list. And then, you know, I could just add that there. And as soon as I click it, and I'm very proud of this, <laughs> it changes to update list. Um, seems really simple. This took me like literally three days to figure out. Um, it, it led me into a, a super deep dive into views reactivity. So this works because I have a function being called within another function and I have a watcher watching for uh, one of the variables that's being updated in that secondary function. So it's, it's, it's a bit daisy chained together, but it works and I'm happy. Uh, and that was one of the big things. Um, so yeah, uh, one of the other things I'm particularly proud of, I wanted to make sure that users could only ever have uh, one instance of a game on their list. Um, I, you know, I made it so that this this button changes and it becomes a patch request. Um, but I wanted to make sure, just in case someone, you know, got, uh, you know, started putting stuff into the console, that they couldn't add uh, another instance of a game. So I have in my database here um, this instance column, uh, and on the creation of you know, when you add a game to your list, it creates an instance which com is comprised of the user ID and the game ID. And this needs to be unique. So you can only have uh, one instance of a game on your list. And yeah, that's about my app. Um, if I had more time, I would absolutely make it prettier. I, I think it looks like crap right now, but it, um, it works. And that was really what I was going for. So uh, thank you for listening. This is a great app, Tyler. And thanks for like walking us through like, you know, what were some interesting challenges and yeah, uh, working with uh, views, like you called it reactivity and sort of the dynamic changes that it does can certainly uh, be tricky. Like how did you go about that three day journey and, and figuring that one piece out was, did you go through tutorials? Did you uh, ask for help? Like, how did you, how did you power through that? So I, I kind of, um, looking back on it, I think it would have been a lot simpler to ask for help, but I, I kind of took this as a personal challenge um, that I, I wanted to, because, uh, you know, I feel like when I'm working on my own things, I'm not always going to have uh, people to help me. And I think it's important to know when to ask for help, but it's also important to be able to get as far as you can on your own. Um, so I wanted to uh, make sure that I could do that if I needed to. So I started okay. just with some Google searches. Um, you know, why isn't this working? Uh, how do I do this thing? Uh, which led me, you know, to another term maybe. Uh, so I learned the term reactivity from a Stack Overflow uh, post. And then I was able to sort of look into that and learn a bit about uh, what things are reactive, what, what things aren't, which, you know, led me to learning about things like computed and watchers and getters and setters. Um, and yeah, once I kind of knew what it was I was looking for, then I turned to uh, video tutorials um, to watch how other people were implementing them. Um, and yeah, so I was able to sort of get through that that way. Got it. Um, no, thanks for walking us through that. It, was there any feature that you worked on that ended up being easier than you thought it would be? Uh, yeah, just like the back end in general, I thought was going to be really uh, complicated, but it turned out being pretty simple. I, I guess I'm super comfortable in Rails. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, uh, doing those link tables, uh, that was that was the moment where the the sort of has many belongs to relation to relationships actually clicked for me. So that was something I was I was uh, a bit worried about that maybe I would get confused or crossed up there, but actually that that ended up being easier than I thought. Got it. If you were to start this project over from scratch, would you change your approach in any way? Um, yes, I I think if I if I had the time and the resources, uh, the first thing I would do is is work with my wife on it, uh, who is a, a graphic designer and a very talented <laughs> one at that. Um, I found it really really difficult trying to make the theme kind of match what I wanted to do. So mm -hmm. it would be really great to collaborate with a designer on that. Um, otherwise, I definitely now that I know how reactivity works and I understand uh, sort of like the computed life cycle hook and everything like that there's definitely certain things in the front end that i would approach differently and certain methods that i would write differently and things like that got it that makes sense um yeah i love video games although i don't get a chance to play them as much as i'd like to but i definitely appreciate this app um great idea and a really nice implementation i'd love to see uh, where you're going to take it eventually thank Congrats. you very much thank you
All right. Well, this concludes our presentations for the day. I want to say again, thank you so much for joining us and thank you to all of our students. Um, like Jay and Peter have both said, uh, these projects are no small feat. We've spent a lot of time working on these. Y'all have learned a ton and it really shines through in each and every one of your projects. And I'm just so proud of you. Um, and thank you again to our career support staff, um, to our TAs, uh, to Jay and all of the rest of our panelists. Um, and thank you for joining us.